Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name's Jason Newland. This is Let Me Bore You to Sleep. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. I'm trying to think, what else do I normally say? Let me bore you to sleep, Jason Newland, the website. Um, that's it really so for those that have never listened before uh, this is just me talking about stuff on this podcast sometimes I talk about my personal life sometimes I talk about stuff that's happened in the past Sometimes I will read out of a magazine. Sometimes I just make up a lot of stuff. It's all kind of a bit of a mixture, really. Um, I'm feeling quite excited today because I got some new socks yesterday and I'm looking forward to wearing a pair. So... What I'm going to do today is, oh yeah, if you want, if you do like this um, podcast, I do have other podcasts as well, and that are aimed at sleeping. I pretty much, I'd say, majority of people that listen to me listen to me for sleeping issues and then there's the people that listen to me for the uh, anxiety, stress, panic attack uh, podcast as well um, but ultimately it's the sleeping ones that seem to be the most popular so it's what I'm kind of getting to be known for um, so yeah, I do have other podcasts, Deep Sleep Whisper Hypnosis, Sleep Hypnosis Weekly, which I get a new recording released every Monday. Um, and these let me bore you to sleep. When I'm on a roll, I generally release one every day. I have periods when I don't make anything for a while, but generally try to make them fairly regularly and on my website there is a testimonial page where you can read what other people have said you could also add your own testimonial uh, letting others and myself of course know how what I do is a benefit to you. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to have a look at the big issue which is a magazine aimed uh, which um, is usually known that homeless people sell them but it's not just for homeless people um, that sell them. People that are having I guess financial difficulties and um, but the, the idea behind it is they well I know I'm, I've got to know one of the ladies who sell it a little bit and she said it costs her £1.20 to buy the big issue and she sells it for £2.50 so she gets to keep the profits that she has to pay out to buy the big issue to start with. So um, I'm going to have a little look. She keeps trying to sell me, sell it to me, and I normally say no, but I'll, I'll buy her a coffee or a sandwich or something because I just. I can't bother to carry it around really. Um, but this is this is it's kind of aimed at uh, 
helping homeless people really that's the the kind of the bottom line but not everybody that sells it is homeless but then homeless doesn't necessarily mean living on the streets um, as I'm sure you know it's sleeping on someone's couch uh, you know, just not having your own place not having your own home it's uh, I've been there myself a few times never lived on the streets I spent one night on the street actually back in 1995 but uh, other than that I have been homeless in the context of not having a home living on someone's sleeping on someone's floor you know but now I'm in a very good position so I'm very fortunate to have my own home so my heart does go out a bit to people and that have housing issues because I spent issues, I spent time over quite a few times over the years with housing issues and even living in places there's housing issues if you're sharing a house with a bunch of people and perhaps it's not quite as uh, perfect perfect uh, situation as it might be um, so, I'm going to read a little bit out of this. It's usually got interviews of famous people and stuff like that. And just, I used to buy it when I was in London actually, because it used to have, I can't remember what it was in here that I liked, but it was something I quite liked in London. Plus, if you travel through London, like on tube stations, train stations, you see about 6,000 big issue sellers on every journey it, you know eventually I think the it's a hypnotic thing it's like just you give up in the end okay I'll have, I'll have, I'll have one even if you don't particularly want it and I did she speaks to this lady I forget what her name is but she said to me that not many people really buy the big issue anymore and I said, it's probably just, it's not like a personal thing to her. It's its kind of the digital age. Less and less people are buying magazines and papers even that are made of paper. They'd just rather just go online and, you know, read it there perhaps on their tablet or their phone but yeah so I'm not quite sure how they're going to they've not kind of caught up with the times yet this uh, the people that produce the big issue it's there probably will come a time and also with the society uh, trying to I don't know who, the bank or the government or whatever, trying to make it more of a, a cashless society, which will put even more demands, I guess, more pressure on people selling things in the street, like the big issue. But uh, we shall see, we shall see. And, oh yeah, I don't know if I mentioned it yesterday. See, my podcasts are all on Spreaker. You can you can see them. They've been um, shared on Spotify, iTunes, uh, podcasts, if various different um, podcast hosts that you can listen to your podcasts on. There's lots of different places, you know, just loads of them. And every, every, I suppose everyone's got their own particular preference. Uh, for example, some people like Stitcher. Some people like TuneIn. Some people like Podcast Addict. Some people prefer Podchaser, you know. It's, uh, I'm quite pleased that I remember those. So there's quite a few. 
Now, I, I started keeping a track of my stats on the website. I spent hours doing that, and I thought, this, this is good, I can kind of go on there and have a look and see how it's going. And then two days ago, I was at 517,000 downloads. And I wake up, not yesterday, but the day before, which would be, which is Thursday today. So yesterday was Wednesday. So that would be Tuesday. I woke up, went onto Spreaker, and just refreshed the stats. And it had gone down to 505,000. So I'd lost, what was it, 505, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So that's 12. Is that right? 12. 12,000 downloads missing from the stats and then I looked at some of the days because the day before I'd had 3,032 downloads and it had gone down to about 2,400 downloads and I'm thinking uh huh what's gone on and I, can't, I couldn't figure it out. How can <laughs> oh, am I having put a minus? How can P, how can it go down? It just doesn't make sense. And there was a a message from Spreaker for all to read, and it said that they are now um, tightening up their stats to so they can be, become a member of an organisation uh, which like some professional organisation but in order to do that they have to give exact stats so I'm guessing before they were just estimating so now well, I guess it's fairly difficult to for them to perhaps see you know exactly because the amount of different podcast hosts so I lost 12,000 downloads and now they're not updating until the day after now so I can't see what the total is until the next day before they used to update continuously so I'm now getting less downloads than I, than I did daily, which is a bit annoying. So it's not a huge amount, you know, but it's still before when I was perhaps getting 3,000, it's now 2,500. 500 is a lot to lose, isn't it? That's quite a big percentage. And I think the first time I noticed it was because on Tuesday, well, like on the Monday, I'd reached a hundred thousand on one of my podcasts. Uh, sleep hypnosis, sleep. I don't know if it's hypnosis for sleeping deeply, something like that, where all my sleep sessions are. And. It was just reached a hundred thousand mark, and the Deep Sleep Whisper Hypnosis podcast was about eighty-seven thousand, I think. And this podcast to let me bore you to sleep was about seventy-seven thousand downloads. So I was looking forward to seeing these reached a hundred. Well, on Tuesday. The one that was over a hundred 
suddenly went down to about 96,000 or 97 something like that the deep sleep one went down again dropped down a few thousand and the let me bore you to sleep dropped down to about 70,000 what <laughs> and I know it doesn't really matter you know technically but it just it does to me I just because I like the idea of reaching a, a large audience and it has grown it's continuously growing but just to lose downloads is just annoying Arr, I'm so annoyed so, so annoyed walking around stamping my feet so yeah I took the stats off the website because I couldn't be bothered to redoing them all so I just took them off but um, I'm just about to reach the 100,000 on the the what is it sleep uh, hypnosis for sleeping deeply so that podcast is only a little way off the 100,000 mark again because that gets like four, five, six hundred downloads a day on that podcast so it didn't take much to get it back to what it was but um, maybe I should just not take so much notice of it all I don't know it kind of it interests me you know I'm interested in it and I suppose that makes sense if I'm this is my life's work really so it's kind of a good thing that I'm interested in what I'm doing but it was such a weird day yesterday generally as well and I've four days in a row now I've woken up about 7 o'clock today was a little bit earlier I think it was about 20 to 7 or 10 to 7 and there's a complete reverse like a 24 hour reverse so instead of going to bed at 7 I'm waking up at 7 but today I'm not feeling as tired as what I was the last three days which is pretty good so it's um, it also means that if I'm going to make recordings I need to make them during the day because I can't wait till 3 o'clock in the morning because I'm in bed by then so I am recording this in my living room and so there's a bit of background sound but not huge amounts but I can't do something and read in the shed because there's no light however I did make a deep sleep whisper hypnosis recording this morning when uh, I got up and I did that in this shed I gotta stop calling it shed. It's my recording studio, don't you know? My recording studio. My studio for recording myself. So, and the background sounds is less in there, which makes sense really, because if you put a structure up inside another room, it's generally going to be quieter in there than it is outside of that structure just like it's quieter inside this building than it is outside this building or it's quieter inside the front door than outside the front door I don't mean actually inside the front door you know it's quite thin I couldn't fit but perhaps if I'm going to, I've, I, did, I have started putting the soundproof foam on the outside and some of it has managed to stick 
some of it fell off so what I'm going to do I can't do it this week because I don't have the money but next week I'm going to get some proper really strong adhesive and also some some soundproofing uh, foam things that you can that I'll put on the inside of it as well so I'm hoping that next week once I start doing that and it's only a shed it's not a big area you know it's to put foam on the outside of it providing it sticks will take me probably a couple of hours if that because the the, the pads or the soundproofing pad things foam pads are, are quite but not tiny you know they're a fair size so that would be nice and I'll put it on the roof as well and then I'll do some stuff on the inside so I'm guessing just having that on the outside will reduce the sound coming in because I think a lot of sometimes the recording studios people have a lot of the soundproofing inside so as not to be heard outside so they might have that recording studio in their house so the neighbours don't hear the guitars and the drums and all that stuff well I don't have guitars and drums and I'm just talking so in a way my only thing that I'm focusing on is not to to calm or to quiet my voice from the outside just to block out outside sounds from my voice when I'm talking and I think it's going to be okay so what I'll do next week I'll get some I already went into the shop to have a look at the stuff and I ended up getting Andre a witch, a witch's broom. Because it's Halloween soon. And that rhymes with broom, doesn't it? Soon. And I thought, because Andre, whenever I'm doing something, he likes to grab hold of stuff. So if I'm cleaning the carpet, vacuuming, he likes to grab hold of the nozzle or if I'm brushing you know something he likes to try and gra grab hold of the brush so I've got this little kids um, it's like the old fashioned witch's broom and I thought Andre would love that because only little but he's only little but he had a little sniff of it rubbed himself over the handle and then just walked off so I don't know I thought maybe it'd be good if I could get him to hold it and take a picture but I might have to wait till next week when I get the super glue I can just glue it to his hands <laughs> not really not really I'm joking I would not really do that I used to dress him up uh, last well it wasn't last year the year before or the year before that I got him a, a Santa Claus outfit but he just didn't like it really doesn't play along you know he looks so cute with his little and it felt it covered his body and again super glue would have really come in handy that day but it was just a little hat wouldn't refuse to wear the hat I suppose what I could have done, got some sellotape and just like sellotaped around the body um, just to sort of keep, not around his body, but around the, the little coat just to keep it tight so it stayed on him. But 
I don't know, I just... The thing is, unlike a dog or a lot of animals, not a lot of animals, but some animals will just stay there long enough for you to take a picture. With him, most of the pictures I get to take is when he's asleep. Because as soon as he sees me taking a picture, he runs off or he stops doing what he was doing. It's very self-conscious, very shy. It's very shy, he's a shy guy. He really is. Let's have a quick little drink. All right. So the big issue cost me two pound fifty. Um, I was actually going to get the lady a cup of coffee, um, instead of buying the magazine, which would have cost me more. But there was a queue, so I thought I'd just get the magazine instead. Okay, so what's the front? It's got a picture of Big Ben. Uh, all right, I've not seen anything. Oh, okay, it says here, a hand up, not a hand out. That's what this magazine says. This magazine was bought by your vendor for £1.25 and sold to you for £2.50. They are proudly working, not begging. Buy it, take it, spread the word. If you can't get hold of a copy of the magazine on a regular basis, you can subscribe to receive the big issue every week bigissue.com forward slash subscribe I suppose if you for people who don't get out of the house but everywhere I've ever been in this country there's big issue sellers everywhere they're just any town there's loads but I suppose if someone's house housebound then that would make sense, I guess, to still buy it online. Read it online would perhaps be something they could do. Check out New Cultural Community Space of South London. No. Uh, no. See star comedians at St Mungo's fundraiser gig for homeless people. So St Mungo's is a charity for homeless people and I nearly uh, worked for them years and years ago. Years and years ago. Okay, so... Uh, Wow, I've not seen anything that I wanted to read yet. So, do I? No. Super bike star Peter Hickman presented a five thousand uh, pound to vendor to help him through leg up. Popular big issue vendor Richie was reduced to tears after his British superbike hero Peter Hickman turned up on his MS Lincoln pitch to present him with a five thousand pound check. Oh the forty seven year old inspired his regular customers to raise six thousand to help to cover his costs of living when he undergoes an operation to 
do something to his leg. It's uh, I used to think, and um, maybe I'm wrong, but well, I seem to be wrong on this one. I thought that the big issue was something that people sold to get themselves back on their feet. But I see people selling it, and I've been selling it for years and years and years and years and years. So it hasn't got them back on their feet, has it? Kind of, unless, I don't know. I thought it would have been a, like a, a temporary thing for them to get help and but there's this, this this lady and she's still doing it she's only 22 or 23 something like that and she's been doing it for years and she's that's just what I thought I mean after I looked into it a long time ago I'm sure it was like a, a short term basically instead of begging to offer someone something that was the idea behind the magazine is to give people something for the money they give to the person uh, you know so someone gives them instead of begging you're actually offering something in return but because I thought about doing it myself once Thank you for getting a smart meter. If you've got one of the 13 million smart meters already installed, you are helping to upgrade Britain's outdated energy system. We'd just like to say thank you. See, I don't have a smart meter. Let me tell you why. I don't want to be constantly seeing how much electricity I'm using we really don't need that <laughs> I'm watching telly and just seeing the money the charges going up and no I don't see any personal benefit to myself for that and if they were forced upon us then the smart meter would be in the cupboard and would be nowhere near me. I would never look at it. I can see the benefit if if you're on a pay-as-you-go meter and the, the meter's outside in the garden, it'd be handy to be able to just look at and see what you got left without going into the garden. Now that would be, you know, useful especially if it's dark outside and you don't have a torch so but other than that no I actually did apply for a smart meter I didn't apply but I inquired or I might not have inquired I phoned up the electric company about something else I think and they said would you like a smart meter and I said, for some reason, I thought, because if I think of a smartphone or stuff like that, I think it's in some way really cool and beneficial and useful. I see no use to the smart meter um, other than feeling guilty for, for using electricity, probably, maybe. I don't know. But I said, yeah, all right then. I didn't really know what it was, but it sounded like a smart idea. I was literally on the phone for nearly an hour, answering question after question after question, listening to script after script after script. And in the end, I said, I forget it. It went on for ages and ages and ages. 
I couldn't be bothered. It was just, you know, it's like, am I, are you, where's, yeah, you know, am I getting paid for this? No. But you are, aren't you? The person on the phone, you're getting paid. See, those scripts, in the old days, I'm going back to like 2000, there wasn't much in the way of, I guess in a way, protecting the customer. The customer didn't have a huge amount of protection, which it's good they do now. So that's what the scripts are for. So people... Uh, when you buy something online, whether it's car insurance or anything, they have to read you a bunch of waffle. And it's basically like a, a contract, and you say yes and all that stuff. Although they do send it to you, email or post, and you can read it through. Like we all read through the small print, don't we? And... I actually, when I started selling insurance, car insurance, I'd do a quote for them. I'd say to them, do you want to pay that on card or direct debit? And they'd say, well, I didn't say I wanted it, did I? I said, card or direct debit. They said, I don't, I don't know if I want it. I said card or direct debit and if they still said I'm not sure I always used to have about five people that would just shout out card or direct debit no I didn't none of that happened but and the it used to be as simple as here's my bank details okay the information is going to be sent to you in a post. You're insured from now, or you'll be insured from Monday, you know, the 14th of October, or whatever. Thank you for calling. Now go away. <laughs> and that'll be it. We'd sort of go on to the next call. That'd be a sale. Brilliant. And then, about probably three, four, five months into me doing the job, someone came around with a piece of paper and they said you have to read this every time you get a sale before you take the payment uh -huh. and it was like two nearly two pages of writing then they came around again a little while later, maybe a week, two weeks, with another piece of paper. Not as much writing, probably half a page. You have to say this before you even start the quotation. Huh? Really? Yes, really. And then they just added on more stuff, reading the Data Protection Act, um, reading, oh, now, before you take uh, this new thing, you had to do, um, before you put the money through, or after you put the money through, it was like all these different scripts that had to be read out at different times. Which made the phone call a lot longer, and made it much uh, more tedious for the customer as well as for the person working in a call centre. And it went from being an easy job for someone that was good at selling to something that made it harder to sell because there was no flow. It was a constant interruption. It was... It was like trying to do the 100 metres race but in six parts you know keep stopping and keep going you know it, there'd be a different winner because not everybody is able to 
keep taking off and getting as fast going, you know. Um, that made sense to me in my mind as I said it. I don't think it sounded very um, logical, but I just started to get a bit silly, but it was about protecting the customer, which I'm all for, you know. It's very good to customers should be protected and looked after but I made it so tedious it was especially so I like talking at people clearly I do this this is what I do I like that but it's not good for selling it's really not it's it's a it's a romance dampener you could say and uh, a sales blocker. He sales blocked me, as, as as they might say. And all these scripts. Oh. And then it got even worse. <laughs> they started saying, when I went to the next insurance job, they said, you need to start asking these questions in a specific way. so the question would be written on the screen and have you got any motoring convictions or just any motoring convictions question mark yes no and then they said well you have to ask it in a specific way do you or have you had any motoring convictions in the last five years with a fault or non-fault and were you wearing flip-flops at the time and it's like literally just they kept adding and adding and adding more questions that had to be asked specifically which surprised me because I was really good at that because I didn't realise how pedantic I am And loads of people were failing the calls, so they'd give it listened to, and um, they had to. They got marked by whether or not they asked the questions correctly, and co you know collected the information correctly from the customer. And I, I suddenly was the top of that. There was one lady that was just behind me on that as well so I was but I was the overall top and I was making £150 a month extra just by doing the you know by doing that correctly because I was getting paid £25 for each 100% mark and very few people got 100% And those that got less than, I'm not sure what the pass mark was, I think it was something like 65% would get in trouble, you know, they get, um, they might lose money actually, yeah I think they did, they'd, lo they'd lose money, they'd lose part of their bonus, so although they were paying people extra for getting a good mark, they were, pay they were losing money if they got a really low mark. So I was getting £25 for each mark I got. And I was pretty much every month I would do... How many did they do? I think they did six. So I think it was £25.50, £25, £125. No. 25, 25, 25, 25, 25. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. 25, 50, 25, 100. 25, 150. So there'd be six. Oh, it was more than 150 then. So it was 60 pounds, uh, six passes. I'd normally get six 100%. 
occasionally I'd only get five. So if I got five, I'd get 50, 125 pound. But if whoever got six passes, 100% passes on their score, would not only get the 150 pound, but they'd get an extra, I think, 50 pound on top of that as a reward for coming top. It might have been £25, but I think it was £50. Now, I didn't get it every month. It was between me and the other lady, but I got it probably three out of five months. So I was ahead, but... Yeah, it was it was close. It was close, but I was... I was just ahead of her. But I think she sold more than me as well, so she was pretty much better at the job than I was in that sense. But it's quite weird because I the the bosses all went out to dinner, like from the head office, and my boss came back and he said, um we were talking about you at lunch. I said, really? I thought it was about the farting because, you know, I'd had a few uh, warnings about it. And uh, he said, no, it's not about the farting, although we do need to have, have another chat about that. We can't afford all the, all the chairs that we keep replacing. I said, okay, I'm sorry. He said, no, it's okay, it's a different subject. Um, you... I said, what do you mean, you? You just, there was a big pause after you said you. He said, didn't you see what just happened? I said, no. He said, look, all, all of the paperwork from my desk just got blue all over the floor. I said, I don't know, I was, I was busy looking at your face, waiting, looking at your lovely mouth, waiting for you to... <laughs> Did you say lovely mouth? I said, no, I didn't say that. He said, uh, I'm just waiting for you to finish your sentence. Because I respect you and you're the, you're the boss. Anyway, why, why is all the stuff blown onto the floor? He said, why do you think? I said, I don't know, that's why I'm asking. He said, Jason, the reason all the stuff's blown onto the floor is because all of the windows in the office, every single window is open. And it's a very windy day and hence all of my paperwork that was sorted and organised is now on the floor in disarray. I said, okay, why is all the windows open? He looked at me, do, do you really need me to answer that? I said, no, no, it's okay, what were you saying? He said, uh, yeah, the, the managers, the, the bosses, said that, that you were the perfect employee. About me, they said that about me. I said, they said that about you. He said, no, that's what you're saying to the people you're listening to. I said, oh, okay. And I said, why is that? Why, why am I the perfect, the, the most wonderful, perfect specimen he said, I didn't say perfect specimen or wonderful. I said, the best, you know, perfect employee. I said, okay. So how come I'm the sexiest? He said, I didn't say sexiest. I said, I know, but, you know, I'll read between the lines. He said, trust me, there are no lines. I said, oh, okay, a bit harsh. And he said, the reason being is because you do everything correctly. You get a hundred percent in practically every single mark. You don't make hardly ever make a mistake. You do the job properly. You talk to the customers. You probably got the best phone voice. I'm adding this bit. I'm not sure if he said that, but I probably did. And he said, and you sell well as well. He said you're the perfect employee. In fact, if we could 
get everybody in this office to be like you, then we'd be a lot more successful. I couldn't help but dance. You know those moments where you don't even realise you are dancing, but your feet, you suddenly realise your feet are just moving on their own. Um, that's what happened, I couldn't help it. It was, it was lovely, it was a lovely feeling. Almost feeling like, I don't know, respected or uh, wanted. It was nice, very nice. And um, he, yeah, that was it. So what happened then is I applied for a job in the compliance department and they were the people that were listening to my calls and basically marking them, you know? And I applied for that job and because I was, I knew it so well and because I kept getting 100%, I was the perfect person really probably me and the other lady but she she wasn't willing to take a 20 pound a year pay cut so um but i just wanted to get out of sales i don't know i didn't she was earning more than me in sales anyway but i was i think uh, i was earning 25000 pound a year there in the sales with all the extra bonuses and stuff and then I went down to, I think I was earning £13,000 a year, which is, what, £12,000 cut, plus there was a bonus that took me up to about 17000 there was like a yearly bonus. So I, I dropped by £8,000 in order to do a, a job that was less problematic to me. And it's one of the best jobs I ever had. As far as I was successful at it, and I think what's good though is I'd, I'd do the call, I'd listen to them, and I'd mark them. And people would come and complain and say, "I never said that." Team leader would say, "No, you need to re-listen to it," and I'd re-listen to it. Or someone else would really listen to it because there was a there was a team of us, three of us, uh, the boss and then me and the other the lady, and someone else had listened to it. It always came up correct. I was always, I never once messed up with the calls, and I was so pleased. Unfortunately, not everybody else was pleased with me because they were losing money offer their bonuses because they just weren't doing what they were supposed to do, weren't asking the questions correctly, weren't giving the correct information to the customers and I didn't like that part of the job because I wouldn't want to affect anybody's wages or money but and I think that came back to sting me in the bum with the next insurance company I worked at because their compliance system it was it so I left my one in nineteen what two thousand and seven June May June time and I went to university in September two thousand and seven to study counselling and then once I finished counselling the course uh, graduated and I, I, I worked as a counsellor until 2013 but in December I think 2012 I started working in insurance again because I'd lost a lot of work due to you know just cuts government cuts and stuff because most of my counselling was with charities and I went back into insurance. So in 2000, it's basically 
2013 because the boat was December 2012 so I don't know how many years that is what 7 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, all of them had to be asked in a certain way every single one not just like a, a few that were important like every single question and not only that they started marking soft skills which they called it which would be um it was their way of stopping people from selling basically it was and I, th I tried to explain to them that I knew how to sell because I'd done it for years I knew how to do the job it's not that it wasn't that difficult it's you know I found it fairly easy to do um but they got a sales trainer in and at this point I was already in the top the top percentage of, of sales people uh, fairly quickly when I first started it took me a couple of months to get into it and then I was doing quite well in fact what happened is when I was in training my biggest issue was the computer system because it was different from the one I tr used before and other people working there had never worked in insurance before so they were learning the system for the first time I, my brain was still a little bit stuck in the old system that I'd used for years and years previously and I had I think I couldn't believe the, the trainer actually said I've got two days uh, and she, they, she took me into personal one on one training uh, for two days and said if you don't because I, I failed one of the tests um, that would allow me to work on the floor and you know to go live or you know, on my own rather and there was there was only about eight of us I think all together in the little training zone around the corner from the actual uh floor the sales floor and she said well if you don't pass this then we'll have to let you go you won't pass the training it was I think a two or three week training I thought oh, okay and it was just how to use the system that was it really so I stayed with her um, and sort of she wasn't with me the whole time she just left me on my own to do stuff but I was sitting separate to the others and what was really weird is I I did that and then I was allowed to go live on the phones because I passed the test and you know and everyone else was live on the phones but we were still separate from everyone else but we were just uh, but they were already live because they'd already passed the test so I passed the test and as soon as I got on the phones after about three days two, three days they said yeah you're ready we're going to put you into your team now so I was the first to go onto the live floor with all the like into a, an actual team and the trainees that I was with they still stayed there for a little bit so after going from being behind I ended up being the first one to join the team and Yeah, I was kind of one of the top sellers. I wasn't the top, but I'd, it was I was doing all right. But then they had this sales training, and we were just mucking around in it, really, just thinking it was funny because, especially I was I was doing the sales training with people that, had, like myself, had been doing it for years. 
what I didn't know is they were going to be marking people by how they sold by the words they used and by the phrases they used they actually wanted us to be like little robots regurgitating these specific sentences and it was a micromanagement at a level that I've never experienced in my life and I said to the management I said I know how to sell car insurance I don't I don't need train I don't need it's always good to have extra training I was up for that any new information is great but then to be told you're using the wrong sentences I was like what you're using the wrong intonation huh very strange so I, I, I lost I lost half of my bonus on a month because I'd said it in the wrong way I'd and um, I think it was like 500 pound or something I lost and uh, I didn't make any new friends that week that's all I'm saying I just said just and I, I kind of thought it was it this that got me back for all the bonuses that people lost when I was doing the compliance in the other place so that was my job though so I suppose whoever was listening to these calls it was their job but the person listening to it was my boss so he'd come in and say why everyone, everyone smile everyone smile and he'd like 10 minutes earlier just told me that I'd lost £500 off my bonus for the month why aren't you smiling <laughs> Oh dear. I thought my whole answer was basically keep keep doing that, but you're gonna have to wait until you need to open the windows. You're gonna have to open the window in a minute, mate. Because I'm gonna let off the biggest fart in history. The thing is it's really I had a really nice boss. It's just uh yeah, he was a really nice bloke. And it's strange how people can be, on some level, difficult, but also on another level, like absolutely really nice. I think it was just the culture of the place, really. It was, they were trying to do something. I don't know what it was they were trying to do. Uh, it didn't work anyway because they're closed but this what's that there's someone outside who's that outside well, I didn't get very far into the uh, big issue did I now this was a boring recording but it's uh, supposed to be isn't it so I'm going to go I'm going to go Thank you for listening. Remember to be kind to yourself because you deserve to be happy. Lots of love. Bye, see bye.